welcome back, Stampeders, to conference number five. Numero five-o. <laughs> For all you Spanglish speakers out there. Yes. Uh, I'm Ben. And I'm John. Let's get right into it. Yeah, welcome back. Let's do it. Okay, so this is case number 16, our first case for conference number five. This was a 50-year-old male who presented with chest pain for only 20 minutes. So it's a really good opportunity to see someone with a super acute presentation. We usually see them that early. Um, this guy just happened to have all of the right things, too. So he had crushing chest pain that radiated to the left arm. He had diaphoresis. He was nauseous, didn't actually vomit, but it was worse with exertion as well. Yeah, so this ECG was actually sent to us by one of our recent graduates and one of our senior residents who was working uh, out at one of our community sites. Um, and I know that deep down inside, there's a proud papa right now in, in Dr. Cooper for this for this one. Tear rolling down right now. All right, so let's jump into it. This is a sinus rhythm with a normal rate, normal axis, uh, and normal intervals. Uh, but I think we really get into the meat and potatoes of the CCG when we start looking at ischemic changes. So we'll start at V1. There seems to be some ST elevations there, about one millimeter of ST elevations in V1. Yeah. Um, and as we continue to look through the precordium, when we look at V2 and V3, those T waves, while I don't think there's a ton of ST elevation there, those T waves look hyperacute to me. Uh, the size of the T wave in comparison to the QRS complex uh, looks looks large to me. Um, so for me, that's concerning for hyperacute T waves. As we continue to go more laterally, we'll see some ST depressions in V5 and V6, and we'll also see some depressions inferiorly in 2, 3, and AVF. So while this not uh, might not meet your standard AHA uh, STEMI criteria, this, I think, is pretty clearly an occlusive MI, um, especially with the symptomatology the patient came in, uh, came in with. And this, uh, this patient needs to have the cath lab activated. And that's exactly what those docs did. And what did they find? They found a proximal 100% LAD occlusion. Lovely, lovely. So I do want to review a couple things that you mentioned. Uh, the first is you say this didn't meet the uh, sort of rigid criteria for uh, for a true STEMI. So let's talk about what that criteria is and why we would want to kind of disregard that criteria um, for this case anyways. And then also maybe talk a little bit more about those hyperacute T waves, especially how they contrast from uh, hyperkalemic T waves. Sure. So classically, we talk about one millimeter of ST elevation in two contiguous leads, um, with the caveat being in leads V2 and V3, we have some different numbers that we follow based on sex and age. And based on this gentleman being 50 years old and a male, we would expect greater than two millimeters of ST elevation in V2 and V3. So for him, we do have some elevations in V1, but I don't think we have elevations in two contiguous leads, which is why I said I don't think we met criteria. Uh, however, uh, I think that based on his story and this ECG, this is clearly an occlusive MI. Agreed. Uh, and now let's talk about those T waves. So those T waves, they have a nice clean takeoff from the QRS complex in V2 and V3. Uh, they are symmetrical, broad-based, um, and in terms of the size comparison to the QRS, they appear large. Uh, contrast that with hyperkalemic T waves. Those we typically classify as more pointy, really uncomfortable to sit on, um, and, and they should not have necessarily that size variation or that size difference from the QRS complex. Very good. Here we go. Next case. Oh, well, that's fast. Yeah. So, that's, that's uh, no bueno. No bueno. Uh, so this is actually the ECG of a woman who was 69, recent ha recently had an intramedullary nail placed uh, by orthopedics and was following up with them in clinic. Um, and they were concerned that there was some um, infection at the site um, of, their, of their operation. So they sent her over uh, to the ER for evaluation and, uh, and treatment. And this ECG was actually recorded when she got there. I mean, I don't know why they didn't take care of it. This ECG is classic post-op infection sign. Yeah, this is very easy for the orthopedist to take care of. They know exactly what this is. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a wide complex tachycardia, right? It's super fast, like around 240, 250. It's really fast and the complex is wide. So uh, immediately, probably where your mind should go first when you see a wide complex tachycardia, 
is ventricular tachycardia and you should treat it as such. Now, there are ways to help differentiate ventricular tachycardia from alternative diagnoses that we'll talk a little bit about here in just a second, but suffice it to say that if you always treat white complex tachycardia as ventricular tachycardia, you cannot go wrong. Because if you treat it as say SVT with aberrancy, which is just the fancy way of saying SVT with a, a bundle branch block, um, then you could potentially really go wrong. Because if you give uh, a patient medicines that you usually use to treat that sort of thing, they could really decompensate. So uh, use electricity, and that's exactly what was done. This patient did convert, but uh, just for an academic sake, we did have a prior ECG. Let's take a look at it. What do you think about this one, John? So this makes me feel perhaps a little bit more comfortable about our prior e or about our ECG that we're looking at. We can see here the underlying right bundle branch block pattern, the RSR prime, the bunny ears in V1, and our sort of upward sloping S wave in V6. Um, so this ECG is consistent with a right bundle branch block. So there is some underlying aberrancy uh, when we talk about our current very, very fast ECG. Okay, let's look at the original ECG that she presented with one more time. So there is a right bundle pattern in this really fast wide complex tachycardia that could be consistent with her underlying right bundle branch block. This very well might be SVT with aberrancy. But there are some other features that suggest against that. For example, the RSR prime in V1 and it's really hard to kind of find out where the R, S, and R prime is in V1. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down to V3, and there I think it's a little bit clearer. I think this is the R. Here's your S, and here's your R prime. So R, S, R prime. And if you follow this all the way up, for example, the R prime here, I'm gonna follow this up to the other leads, you can see that little deflection right there, that little deflection. And I think that's the R prime. So I think the true R is this first upward deflection, and then it goes into the R prime. And so if you see that the first R is greater in amplitude than the R prime, that's almost always ventricular in origin. Now there are some other findings. There's lots of ST changes. There's some ST elevation in V1 and V2, and then you see some depressions out laterally and inferiorly. That's probably all rate dependent. I wouldn't make too much of that unless you cardiovert her, get a repeat ECG, and you still see those, and that would be more worrisome. Um, but it's it's hard for me to say exactly what this is, but I know how I would treat it. Shocky shock shock. <laughs> Shocky shock shock. <laughs> yes. Electricity. Definitely. Uh, the great thing about electricity is you can give it and then it's done. The bad thing about drugs is that you give it and then it's not done. Now, I'll put one caveat on there. I think adenosine would be reasonable in this patient. Uh, if you're considering SVT with aberrancy and you think that there's a really good chance that that's what it is, probably not unreasonable to give the patient a, a dose of adenosine to see if they respond. If they do respond and they convert, it was probably SVT with aberrancy. Now there is a certain subset of ventricular tachycardia that can respond to adenosine that's pretty rare. So it's probably reasonable to suspect that that really was SVT with aberrancy. Um, and the great, good thing about adenosine is it only lasts around for a few seconds and then it goes away. So it's not as bad as giving something like say DILT or metoprolol that's gonna hang around for a long time. All right, so this was a patient that I saw at LBJ. It was a 61 year old female who had episodic chest pain for a couple of weeks. And we got this ECG in, in triage. It's important to note that she was chest pain free when she got this ECG, no complaints whatsoever, but it was exertional episodic chest pain for a couple of weeks. What do you think about this ECG? So I think that because you play the game ECG Stampede, when you signed this ECG, you said, bring it back now, right? Indeed I did. Yeah. So when I look at this, uh, we find a sinus rhythm uh, with a normal axis, normal rate, uh, and normal intervals. Uh, again, I think the money here is in what we would be concerned for for ischemic findings. So if you look at V2 and V3, we have these biphasic T waves, this up-down motion. And when you look at, keep going laterally into V4, V5, V6, we continue to see inverted T waves. And those are symmetric inverted T waves. We draw a line right down the middle. 
it looks like it's pretty much even on both sides. Um, so those are all concerning um, findings for ischemia for me, and they actually continue on to the inferior leads as well. We see some T-wave inversions over there as well. Um, but for me, that this ECG with the story, so the chest pain, now chest pain free with this ECG is most consistent or most concerning for Wellens syndrome. Yeah, this was a classic Wellens case. She indeed went on to get a cath. We had to transfer her to another hospital because our county hospital that we work at doesn't have a cath lab. So she got transferred, got cathed. What do you think they found? I think they found something bad. Yeah, it was like, like a 95 Well, it was a 95% <laughs> yeah. stenosis of the proximal LAD, uh, and she got successfully stented. I got a question for you though. Let's say we saw this ECG in someone who's chest pain free, then they developed chest pain. We got another ECG, and then the T waves became upright and looked like pretty normal, like just normal T waves that I would find probably in you, John, then what would you think? Yeah, so that actually might be even more concerning. Um, that pseudo normalization of the T wave uh, mm -hmm. could be nice. telling us, yeah, fancy terms, right? <laughs> uh, that this person is actually having an occlusive MI right now and needs more urgent or even emergent cath. Yeah, so uh, you know, normally, Wellens and someone who's chest pain free that presents with this sort of ECG, it's an urgent problem. It definitely needs to be addressed. A patient does not go home, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to activate the cath lab. They just need an urgent cath. This patient ended up going over to, to uh, another one of our facilities with a cath lab, waited till the following morning to get the cath, which is totally reasonable. Uh, but had she developed chest pain, I saw that pseudo normalization, I probably would have just activated the cath lab. Yeah. Get, get her that PCI now. Yeah, cool case. Okay, next case was an 83-year-old female that presented with palpitations. John, I believe this was your patient. Oh yeah, this is actually my case. Um, I saw this woman, she was lovely. Um, and she came in with kind of an interesting story. She was having these intermittent palpitations and then also having intermittent dizziness um, when we saw her. Um, and you know, she came in with normal vital signs with a heart rate in the 80s or 90s. Um, and her initial ECG, we actually don't have here, but showed ventricular bigeminy. Um, and she was pretty much asymptomatic at that time when we were speaking. Um, and then I was alerted by one of our nurses that she had a change in her heart rate um, and that they were doing an ECG because our nurses are really top notch where we work and, and they brought me this ECG. So slow, slow, I can, I can tell you that. Yeah. It, it looks like it's sinus because I see a P wave for every QRS and the QRS for every P. So this is sinus Brady. It looks like to be about 40 is the rate. Mm -hmm. And so rate rhythm axis, Ooh, the axis, the axis is weird. It's down going in one, it's down going in AVF. So you're kind of out there in no man's land that some people would call it an extreme right axis deviation. But I always think that that is a little weird. So if you look at your, you know, your quadrant, this is the normal axis of the heart right there. But you're up in this quadrant right here. And so that is, that's a weird quadrant to be in. And I, it always makes me wonder if that's really true or if there's some sort of like limb lead problem. And if we look at AVR, we see that it's up going primarily in AVR, the complex is. And then we look in V6 and it's also up going, like that should never happen. That doesn't make any vector sense. It does you know, not. Direction, magnitude, all those fancy superhero all those names. things. Yeah, uh, it, because uh, AVR goes to the right side of the heart. V6 is out laterally on the left side of the heart, so the resultant vector should not be going in the same direction. So if you ever see that happening, then that is limb lead reversal. So while it doesn't change the fact that this patient still had sinus bradycardia that needs to be addressed, there is also a limb lead reversal on here. And it sounds like almost what you're describing is she had these like episodes of palpitations and then she get dizzy and you got this ECG while she was dizzy. That makes me wonder if she's got like tachybrady syndrome and the sinus node just isn't working very well. Yeah, totally agree. That's a, that was our working diagnosis. We agreed, we thought this was a limb lead reversal, um, but our working diagnosis was something like tachybrady uh, syndrome or some sort of sinus 
node dysfunction um, because of her symptomatology and these ECGs and that we were getting. Did you go personally fix the limb leads that you messed up in the first place? So I personally probably did mess them up in the first place if I had to guess and uh, and no, someone much smarter than me fixed okay. the problem. Good. Yeah. Get a tech that does much better work than you do Agreed. to fix that. And then this is what you get. Uh, yeah. Normal looking axis. So this makes a lot more sense. Still sinus ready, still needs to be addressed. And that kind of grab bag of sinus node problems we collectively refer to as sinus node dysfunction. Yeah. So if you got someone that has like a very inappropriate chronotropic response of their sinus node um, or is very bradycardic or has sinus arrest or tachybrady syndrome, that's just kind of a grab bag term that we use to describe all those problems that sinus node dysfunction and that person needs a pacemaker. Yeah, and that was really our working diagnosis and our plan, and, and that's what we did. We admitted this woman um, so that she would be evaluated by cardiology and EP and hopefully get a pacemaker placed. Very good. So that's it, right? Yeah, that was it. Until next time. See you then.